Well, Jesus, we thank you uh, for this morning. Uh, we thank you that, um, hmm, like you tell us in Exodus, that you are full of mercy and grace, that you abound in steadfast love and faithfulness. Um, and God, today as we walk in here from weekends and weeks, um, from some of us from really good ones, from some of us from ones that we never want to walk through again. Would we find grace? Uh, would we find grace this morning? Grace that says it's going to be okay. Grace says that we're okay with you. And grace says that even in this season, you can use it. And you are using it uh, to form us and shape us into the men and women of faith that you want us to be. And so, God, would you just comfort us in this morning, uh, and would you send us out of here in peace? And if you would, take a moment and pray for yourself and ask the Lord to teach you the day. And if you'd be so kind, uh, pray for me that I would speak clearly and be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the greatest superhero movie uh, ever made was the trilogy by um, Mr. Nolan called The Dark Knight. And for all of you Marvel people out there, you're, you're wrong. It's okay. I love you. God loves you. But you, you are wrong. The Dark Knight trilogy is the greatest superhero trilogy that has ever been made. Uh, because in it, Batman, uh, who, who becomes Bruce Wayne, becomes Batman. I, I think he's been Batman the whole time. He just kind of facades as Bruce Wayne. It's great. But in there, you've got these three movies. And what you realize is that Bruce Wayne leaves Gotham because he realizes there's a problem that he can't fix. There's nothing that he can do. There's no business he can build. There's no money he can throw at that it's really going to fix the problem. And before things get real bad, he goes off and gets ready. And he goes and trains with the League of Assassins. He becomes this ninja, awesome warrior. And then he comes back and all ruin begins to break loose. And you see that he goes before everything gets crazy and he gets prepared to face the insanity that's about to face Gotham City. And then uh, movie number two comes around. And you realize that even in the mess, that even in the crazy, even in the betrayal, Batman is ready to do what is needed for Gotham and not needed for Batman. That he's ready to be the man that they need him to be, not the hero they deserve. He's fantastic. Batman's the best. And you realize that even when the city turns against him, he doesn't turn against the city. That he's willing to do what's right for them and best for them, even when it's not easy for him. And then at the end of the movies, um, eventually Batman does get old. It's a very sad reality that us in our 30s always don't believe. But eventually Batman does get old, and he has to bring up this new guy. And the final movie closes, and you see Dick Grayson begin to walk into the Batcave, and he's going to become Batman. That there's going to be a future for Gotham even when he's gone. That there's going to be a hope at the end of the story even when he uh, can't walk anymore because he's got a bum leg. No, why I'll tell you that? For Well, one, if you've never gone home and watched the Dark Knight trilogy, you, you should. Uh, you've got a long week coming up next week, so I know how you should use it if you've never done that. Don't watch the Cowboys lose again. Don't waste your time. Go watch Batman. It'll be fantastic. Um, if you have watched Batman, uh, good for you. Uh, I love you. I like all of you, but you, you, you win special points in my heart this morning. Uh, but what we realize is that Batman and Jesus have some similarities. Yeah, I went there. Um, Jesus is not the dark night. He is the night that we all deserved. He's the hero that we didn't need, but the one we wanted. Uh, anyways, Jesus, uh, in his grace, prepared everything that we needed. Jesus, in his grace, forgave us even when we turned against him and, and did what was good for us even when we were running from him. And that Jesus, in his grace, made a way that there would be a future and a hope for us. And that's what we're going to see this morning is that grace does uh, four things, that grace does something before we sin, grace does two things in our sin, and then grace does something after we sin. That there's grace that surrounds all of our failures. Before we fail, there's grace. In our failure, there's grace. And then even after our failure, there's grace. And the first thing we're going to see is this, that God is gracious before our sin. 
Nahum chapter 2 uh, tells us the story of the destruction of Nineveh. So the evil capital of the kingdom of Syria, God is finally bringing the judgment that they deserve. Like they're morally wicked people. If uh, you want to play catch up, we've got some sermons online. Like they were just awful, like objectively evil humans in an empire. Like they needed to go. And the time has finally come. And in chapter 2 and chapter 3, we see their destruction foretold by the Babylonians. And then in verse 2, there's this like little shining light in the darkness. In verse 2 of chapter 2, Nahum says that Israel has ruined branches. Uh, and the Hebrew word uh, for bran- ruined branches is uh, zemorah, which means vine branches or just branch. Um, and this word for vine branches, zemorah, only shows up five times in the entire Hebrew Bible, the entire Old Testament. Only five times. Once here in Nahum, once in Numbers, once in Isaiah, and then twice in the book of Ezekiel. And it comes from the word zamor, uh, and zamorah comes from the word zamar. You can see how they're similar, meaning to trim or to prune. So one's a branch and one's what you do. You cut a branch that it might grow. And zamar only shows up in the Old Testament three times, twice in Leviticus and once in Isaiah chapter 5. Now, why do I tell you that? It's not because there's going to be a quiz, but because words matter. And word choice matters. If you've ever been in a fight with someone and they've said something and immediately gone like, I didn't mean to say that. It doesn't matter. Like, it's already out of their mouth. Like, words matter. And the biblical authors use particular words on purpose. And the word Nahum uses is the word for vine branch that only shows up five times uh, in its verb form three times in the entire Old Testament. Why? Because Nahum and Isaiah, uh, they lived at the same time. They lived in the same region around the same time period, uh, and Nahum would have heard the message of Isaiah, just like when you're in your car listening to whatever you listen to, podcasts, music, radio, CDs. I still have some. They're incredible. But whatever you listen to, like you sometimes begin to hear those words coming out of your mouth because they inform your mind and your vocabulary. And the same thing is going on with Nahum. Like he's heard the message of Isaiah, and it is changing how he interacts with people. And in Isaiah chapter 5, we read this. So we're going to start in Nahum, travel through Isaiah, in back in Nahum. All right? Cool. Isaiah chapter 5, starting verse 1 says, Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved has a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out or dug out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you that what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste, and it shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. So Isaiah starts with this story, this picture uh, of God and Israel. God's the vine dresser. Israel is the vine. And in the picture, uh, God's the vine dresser, and he sees that he's the one who plants the vine. He's the one who prepared the place for the vine. He's the one that gave the vine everything it needed to grow and to thrive. That the vine had everything it needed to grow and thrive and produce grapes. And what happened? Instead of the vineyard producing grapes, what it was meant to produce, it produced what they called wild grapes. And I I didn't know this, uh, but wild grapes are sour, inedible, and entirely useless for making wine. What's the point of the metaphor? That ever before Israel sinned, even before God rescued Israel out of Egypt and put them in the land of Canaan, God was preparing to give his people everything they needed to love him, to grow, and to thrive. And he did. He gave them everything they needed to grow and to thrive, but they didn't. Because of sin, they made a mess of their lives. Because of sin, like, we make a mess of our lives. Because of other people's sin, like, that sometimes makes a mess of our lives too. Even before we sinned, just like with Israel, God in his grace gives us everything we need to grow and to thrive. But we don't. But the point is that God is gracious to us even before we sin. Romans 5 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, Justin, that was like 3,000 years ago, plus some. But now we're 
2,000 years post-Jesus, which means that God has already sent Jesus. And according to the book of Romans and the New Testament, God has already prepared and given us everything we need for life and faith in him in Jesus, that God has been gracious to us even before we were. Like Paul wrote this to some people who had like been around when Jesus was alive and crucified. We're reading this 2,000 years later. Like Jesus has already come and given us everything we need that we might have faith in life, that we might grow and thrive under God and in Jesus. Like his grace has gone before us even before we were, even before we sinned and given us everything we need. God's gracious to us before we sin, and God is gracious to us in our sin, which seems like a little strange, right? Like, okay, like God's going to be the nice God before we're like sinful, awful people, but as soon as we sin, like he's going to turn on us, right? No, he doesn't. God is even gracious to us in our sin. Did you see it in Romans 5? For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't that God sent Jesus when we started cleaning up our lives. Like God sent Jesus into the mess. God sent Jesus to rescue sinners while they were still sinning. God sent Jesus after us when we wanted nothing to do with him. It wasn't like, oh, you sinned and want nothing to do with me? Fine, just come back. He's like, no, 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 you're gonna run, you're gonna sin, I'm gonna run after you and I'm gonna deal with your problem because you can't solve it. God's gracious before we sin and he's gracious to us in our sin. And we see that in our sin, he's gracious to us in two ways. He's gracious to forgive us, and he's gracious to form us. He's gracious to forgive us and to form us. Luke 23, uh, verses 33 and 34, Jesus says this, and when they had came to the, uh, the gospel says this, and when they had came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him, Jesus. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they cast lots to divide his garments. God is gracious to us even in our sin to forgive us. Like Jesus is literally being murdered. He's being tortured and hung up to suffocate on his own blood. He doesn't yell at them. He doesn't say, how dare you? He doesn't say, you just wait. (laughs) He doesn't say, oh, you started it now. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the same is true for us. Like even in our sin, forgiveness is already extended. Like he's not there to shame us. He's not there to guilt us. He's not there to remind us of all the record of wrongs. Because every single one of them, past, present, all of them which were future when Jesus died, have been paid for and dealt with so that even in our sin, he can extend forgiveness to us. No one's like that, (laughs) but Jesus is. God's gracious in our sin to forgive us, and he's gracious in our sin to form us. Hebrews chapter 12, chapter 12, verses five and six say, and have you forgotten the exhortation or the encouragement that addresses you as sons? My son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Discipline is is just another word for formation. And formation is just another word for discipline. But formation has an F, so my outline works. God's working in us to shape us character, perseverance, um, trust, faith, and a love for him and a love for him alone, even in our sin. Even when we run, even in our sin, God's using our choices. God's using our sinful pursuits to shape us to love him and love him alone. Like, okay, you want to run after that? Go run for it and see, see where it ends. And I'm going to be right there when you realize that it doesn't have what you want. You think that's going to bring you joy? You think that's going to bring you peace? You think that's going to bring you comfort? You think that's going to bring you satisfaction? You think that's going to get you the status that you really want? You think that's going to heal the problems in your families? I know it's not. And I'm going to tell you it's not, but sometimes he lets us run because he knows like it's only in the running that like we're going to run back to him. And he's right there when we turn around saying, I got you. I know. I already died for it. We're okay. Let's come back. And he uses the hard things to form us. And the reality is that formation's hard. Like discipline isn't easy. Like that's why it's called discipline. 
Uh, it's not fun. It's never easy. It's always painful. Verse 11 of chapter 12 of Hebrews says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. No one enjoys running. There's weird people who do, and I don't understand you. No one enjoys running. No one really enjoys, like, lifting heavy things. Like, we, we don't. Like, no one enjoys expense reports. You accountants, I'm really grateful that you exist. But no one really enjoys expense reports. But there's things we have to do to make life go well. If you want to run a race, like, you've got to run in order to get ready for the race, unless you're one of those weird cross-country kids that you just, like, were born out of the womb, able to run eight miles an hour eight-minute miles uh, while walking. Uh, some of you are accountants, and you just love expense reports, but like, we all have things in our life that we know are good for us. We just don't like to do them, whether it's running, lifting weights, eating right, filling out expense reports. Someone might be behind on their receipts. I'm just hypothetically spitballing that out here. But it makes life go better. But discipline's never easy. It's always hard. Loving Jesus more than us is never easy. It's always worth it, but it's always hard. Loving Jesus more than money, loving Jesus more than that promotion, loving Jesus more than fill in the blank, it's never easy. It's always worth it, and it's always hard. And in the moment, it feels incredibly difficult. The Bible's honest about that, but on the other side of it, you know it's worth it. On the other side of training, on the other side of actually turning in your receipts, on the other side of doing the hard thing that you know that's good for you, you know it's always worth it. It always is worth it in the end, even if you don't feel like it's worth it in the moment. And God, even in our sin, uses the hard moments of our choices to form us and shape us, to produce godly character, to produce a love for Jesus and Jesus alone inside of us. Even in our failures, he can shape us inform us. Isaiah chapter 10 says this, uh, in the day that the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but they will lean on Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel in truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God, for though your people Israel be as good, uh, be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness, for the Lord God of hosts will make a full end as decreed in the midst of all the earth. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, which is Jerusalem, be not afraid of the Assyrians when they strike with the rod and lift up their staff against you as the Egyptians did. For in a very little while, my fury will come to an end and my anger will be directed to their destruction. And Yahweh of hosts will wield against them a whip as when he struck Midian at the rock of Oreb, and his staff will be over the sea, and he will lift it up as he did in Egypt. And in that day, his burden will depart from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be broken because of the fat. So in Isaiah chapter 5, we saw God told Israel that because of their sin, though he gave them everything they needed to thrive and to grow, and they chose to sin, that he was going to remove this hedge of protection, that there was this force called the, the love and strength of God that protected Israel against the other countries and forces in the world. And he said, you run and you run and you run, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to remove it, and I'm going to let you have what you want. And they ran and they ran and they ran and eventually said, okay, here they come. You want to live like the nations, live, live like the nations. And they come in, they get taken over by the Assyrians. And then in chapter 10, we hear that that's not the end of the story, that a remnant will return, that though they thrived and grew, that they were like the sands of the sea, that they're going to face judgment and they're going to get destroyed, but not to a full end, that there's going to be a remnant that would return, that even in their sin, God was going to be gracious to them, that I'm not going to run you out of town and completely wipe you off the face of the earth. Like, I'm going to deal with the problem and the sin, but there's still some people that love me. There's still some people that love me more than anything else. There's still people that have faith in me. And so I'm going to deal with the sin of these, and I'm going to protect a remnant. And I'm going to bring a remnant that loves me and is faithful to me. And in exile, in pain, 
in the consequence of their sin, I'm going to teach them and form them that they might love me more than anything else. And when the time is right, I'm going to bring them back. Why? Because I've already dealt with their sin. I've already made the decision to forgive them, but I still need to form them. That's sometimes why sin has consequences. Not because we have to pay for it, like Jesus paid it all. But sometimes, in his wisdom and mercy and grace, God lets us walk through the consequence of our sin because he knows it's going to form in us. He's going to form in us a character. It's going to form in us in love. It's going to form in us an endurance that when we hit that next season, we love God more than we did. We can endure more difficulty than we used to be able to, that we can persevere through it, that our character won't be changed by our circumstances, but will be steadfast in the midst of suffering. And so sometimes God lets the consequence of our sin come in to form us, to shape us, to be more and more like Jesus. He's gracious to us before we sin, to give us everything we need, even though oftentimes we, we squander it and throw it away. God's gracious in our sin to forgive us and to form us. And God is also gracious to us after our sin. So Isaiah 5, right? You sinned and I'm going to remove the protective hedge and you're going to go into exile. And that's where we find them in the book of Nahum. They're in exile. Isaiah chapter 10, but there's hope. Like, I'm doing something in the sin. I'm going to forgive you. I've already dealt with it. I'm going to form you. It's going to take a while. It's going to be painful, but don't lose heart. Don't lose hope, because I'm still going to be gracious to you on the other side of it. His grace doesn't run out. Isaiah chapter 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of Yahweh. Isaiah switches his writing from talking about a a grapevine to talking about a tree. And God says that from this stump, this tree that got cut down to the ground, like a little branch is going to begin to grow that when it looks like all hope is lost, spring is going to rise up. When it looks like darkness is won, light's going to begin to shine. When it looks like Israel's ruin has overcome any hope that God could save them, restoration begins to come. That even in their sin, God extends grace. Even after their sin, God extends grace. That God's working ruin, even uh, that even in their ruin, God is working restoration, which brings us back to Nahum chapter 2. I told you we'd get there. Nahum chapter 2, verse 2. For Yahweh is restoring the majesty of Jacob as the majesty of Israel. For plunderers have plundered them and ruined their branches. God is gracious to Israel after they sin to restore them from their sin. Why is that necessary? Because sin breaks relationships, right? Like, we're going into Thanksgiving week, and I'm pretty sure all of us can remember when a brother or a sister or an aunt or a mom or a dad did something. And for some of us, Thanksgiving's not like a really fun week because we're reminded of all of the pain. When everyone else is celebrating, everyone else is having a great time, like, we're just not. For some of you, like, this is, like, one of your favorite weeks out of the year. Like you can't, you're so ready for all the family to come in. You're ready for your friends to come over on Tuesday so that they can have Friendsgiving and then you're gonna get ready for Wednesday to have every, all your family over on Thursday and you are just so excited about all the people that are coming to your house and you can't wait and you've been decorated for three months and you've had your calendar, you've had your meal plan since last December and you are ready to go. I'll pray for you. And some of you are ready to go, even with rough relationships. Some of you have had strained relationships with parents. Some of you have had strained relationships with kids. Some of you have had strained relationships with brothers and sisters. And in the grace of God, that relationship has been repaired. And so you all come to the table as family. Like you all come to the table as friends. And you laugh together, and you eat together, and you're going to have a great time this next week. Why? Because there was a restored relationship. Like, was there sin and a problem? Yes. But was it dealt with? Yes. And what did that lead to? Restoration. 
like your friends again, like your family. Like there's a good relationship there, and that's what God wants for us. Now, for some of you, you're going to walk in the next week, and it's just, it's not that picture. For some of you, you're going to walk in the next week, and maybe you're not going home. Because there is still sin that's fractured there. Maybe you're not going home, and maybe this is one of your first Thanksgivings without a loved one or a friend. Maybe you are going home, and you're just going to do your best to, like, dodge and avoid. Why? There's not a restored relationship there. Like, there's still pain. There's still strife. Like, the problem was never dealt with. But the good news of Jesus is that the problem has been dealt with. Like, we're welcome to God's table as sons and daughters, as his kids. Because even when he gave us everything we needed, and we made a mess of it, in our sin, he forgives us and he forms us so that when we come back to him, he might restore us. That we might be welcomed into the house, that we might be welcomed into the table, not to talk about all the things that we did and all the reasons that he's so gracious to let us sit here, but talk about all the good that he's done in our life, to talk about all the good that he still has for us, to rejoice and to celebrate. That's the point of a shoot growing up from the stump, that the story's not over. Which also means for some of you that next week's not going to be easy. Like, the story's not over. Like, like don't lose hope. Like, it, it, it might still make next week hard. Week after next. I'm getting get my weeks confused. But just because it's hard doesn't mean it's hopeless. As long as Jesus is alive, (laughs) there's hope. There's hope for your family. There's hope for your friends. And maybe that hope is you showing up and being light in a dark place. Maybe that hope is you walking in, being ready to extend grace and forgiveness. Maybe that hope is you, like, spending all of this week, like, coaching yourself and praying, like, God, help me be gracious, help me be gracious, help me be gracious, because I'm going to want to punch them in the face. But you walk in there not in anger, You walk in there not in frustration. You walk in with forgiveness extended and open hands of grace. And maybe you have to duck out every now and then to collect yourself, and that's okay. (laughs) But maybe God wants you to rise up and be hope and life and grace and extend the same grace to your family and the same grace to your friends that he's extended to you, that you welcome them just as you've been welcomed by him. Because he was gracious to us before we sinned. He was gracious to us in our sin. And he's gracious to us after our sin to restore us, to bring us back into the family. So what do you do with grace? What do you do with grace? Well, grace is just a churchy word for gift. Something you didn't earn, something you didn't deserve. After Thanksgiving comes the most wonderful time of the year. And uh, you're going to get gifts from bosses, you're going to get gifts from friends, you're going to get gifts from families, Uh, and not because you did anything great, but because they're just kind humans and individuals. Now, your boss might be doing it because they're told to, but hopefully you have a friend or a family member that just does it because they love you, and they love you, and they love you, and that's grace. Like, it's a gift. You don't earn it, you don't deserve it. Um, And we've all had good gifts, and we've all had bad gifts. And the reality is we either receive them or we reject them. I remember it was 99, 2000. Uh, it was right after the first Star Wars movie came out. Uh, some of you don't even, uh, I mean, episode one, for those of you that are d- disagreeing with me that the first Star Wars movie is episode four, it is in chrono- whatever, we can argue, email me later. Anyways, episode one came out, and then at that same time, the N64 had been released, and it was... Uh, the newest game console with Banjo-Kazooie. It was awesome. And they had released a uh, Star Wars pod racing game. And my brother and I wanted it so, so bad. But we didn't have the game, and we didn't have an N64. And, like, we just, it wasn't going to happen. And we had this thing where we'd wake up at, like, 3, 4 in the morning, sneak into the living room, open our, bring our stockings back to our bedroom, dump them out, look at all we got, eat a few of the things, like, try to stuff them back in, and then put them on the mantle and go back to sleep. 
So we wake up to go get our stockings, and I kid you not, in the living room, out of the box, hooked up with the games laid out, is an N64 and a few other games that I remember not. I think one of them was like a Mario game, but there's Star Wars Pod Racers. And we look at it like, this is the greatest Christmas ever! And so we, we get the game, we turn the TV on, we plug it in, and we just start racing and racing and racing. And I don't know how long goes by, but eventually we hear this like, and my dad begins to walk down the hall, and it's still dark, and he goes, what are you boys doing? We're, we're playing the game. It's not Christmas morning yet. Go back to bed. But dad, go back to bed. And so we turn it off and kind of push the controllers back up, and we go back to bed to sleep because we know on the other side of that door and hallway is Star Wars pod racers. We don't care what else is under the tree. We got an N64 and we got Star Wars and we are jazzed. Greatest Christmas ever. And we received that with such joy and thankfulness. And I remember no other gift from that year, but we got an N64 and Star Wars pod racer. Fast forward about a decade. I'm a groomsman in a wedding and we do the whole groomsman party, and then he gives us all of our groomsman gifts, and they were preparing to be missionaries. We weren't, like, expecting much. Like, I was honestly shocked that there was a gift. Like, it, it, I was just like, oh, cool. Like, you got us a gift. Like, you didn't have to do that. Like, you're about to move to China. Uh, you're going to get married and go. Like, you didn't need to, but, like, really appreciate it. See? Grace. And open it up, and there's this Texas A&M beer mug and a, a, a Texas A&M ballpoint pen. Mark, did you, like, get this from, like, are you re-gifting graduation presents to us right now? Because I think that's what this is. And I look around, he's like, no, like, he got all five of us groomsmen this, like, Texas A&M beer mug. Like, we were all Aggies. And this Texas A&M ballpoint pen that's, like, not even enjoyable to write with because it's too heavy. It's weighted wrong. I'm bougie about my pens. It's fine. And I'm just going, like, I'm, like, never going to use this. Like, I just, like, it's, my wife isn't going to let this in the house. Like, this is not the decor that she's okay with. Um, and, like, I am under one too many contracts between going to Southern Seminary and working for the North American Mission Board. Like, alcohol is, like, not allowed to touch this lip and mouth. Like, this is just, this is a waste. But I'm like, thanks, Mark. And I don't think it took, like, a week for it to end up at Goodwill. I received the gift, but let's be honest, I rejected it. N64 pod racers all day long. Mass produced beer mug? Yeah, no thanks. I'm going to tell you that. Because when it comes to grace, we can either receive it with joy or reject it with a lot of other things. We're either going to receive it in joy and gratitude and thankfulness or we're going to reject it in cynicism in pride, in I know better, and I don't need that, and in self-sufficiency. I've already got everything I need. I don't need that. And I'm better than that. Uh, thanks, but no thanks, Mark. I actually prefer this type of pen, and that's not this type of pen, so that's really cute, but I don't need this. We're either going to receive it in joy or reject it in pride, in cynicism, in false self-sufficiency, but it's going to be one of the two. And all of us are going to do one of the two. We're either going to receive it or we're going to reject it. But Justin, why would someone reject grace? Why would someone ever reject Star Wars and Banjo-Kazooie and Mario 64 and an N64? I don't understand. But ultimately, someone rejects something. They reject a gift. They reject grace. Because they think they don't need it, or they think they can earn what it offers. Some of you might be here today just rejecting the grace of God that says you're forgiven. Rejecting the grace of God that says, like, you're welcome at the table to be restored. Because you either think you don't need it, or you think you can do enough good things to be welcomed into the family. And like we can't. I'm not saying you can't do good things. People do good things all over the world all the time. I'm just saying your good things can't outrace your bad things. 
All your good deeds can't erase your sin. And the whole ideology of either I can earn it is just ridiculous. Like, it's a gift. Like, fundamentally, like, you don't earn gifts. You earn bonuses, but you don't earn gifts. Gifts are freely given, and they're meant to be freely received. But you can't earn it. That's not how grace works. And so we're either going to receive it or we're going to reject it. Others of you might be saying, Justin, that's great for everyone else in this room, but you don't know how deep my sin runs. Like, you don't know how far away from the table I am. You don't know how long I've been gone. Like, for the rest of you churchy people, like, yeah, there's grace for you, but there's not enough for me. Like, I'm too far gone. I've done too many things. I've done something that's just way too awful. God would never forgive that. And you're right, I don't know. I don't. But Jesus does. And in knowing the depths of your sin and the depths of my sin and our sin, he said, no, I'm going to come to earth for them. I'm going to die on a cross for them. I'm going to come and forgive them that they might have a restored relationship with me. Julia H. Johnston put it this way in 1910. Grace, grace. This is one of my grandfather's favorite songs. God's grace. Grace that will pardon, forgive, and cleanse within. Grace, grace. God's grace. Grace that is greater than all all our sin. Not some of it, not parts of it, not past sins, not the day sins, but all of it. His grace has been before you sinned, He's been gracious to you in your sin, and he's going to be gracious to you after we sin. He gives us everything we need. He forgives us and he forms us that he might restore us to the table. His grace is greater than all our sin. Will you receive it or will you reject it? Let's pray. Well, Jesus, we thank you that you came and did what we couldn't. God, I I ask that in the power and kindness of your spirit that you would just quiet the voices in our souls and minds right now that say, yeah, but not me. That I'm I'm, I'm too far, I've done too much, like my situation, no, like just in your kindness and grace, just shut that voice. And would for the next few moments as we prepare to wrap up and walk out of here, just sit in the grace that's been offered and given that we would know we're forgiven people that we would trust the process as you form us and that we would accept the invitation to be restored to the table would your kindness lead us to repentance would you help us to fix our thoughts and minds on Jesus and all that he's done for us we pray in Jesus name